By now, we're all familiar with the novel COVID vaccines, a short strand of either messenger RNA or double-stranded DNA encoding for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Over the next few minutes, I want to explain why mass vaccination with this generation of vaccines may be problematic or actually counterproductive in the fight against COVID-19. Much of this is excerpted from the COVID A to Z video and may be mostly redundant for those who watch that video in its entirety, but based on the video statistics, that seems to be the minority, and I believe this issue is important enough to warrant a dedicated presentation. SARS-CoV-2 is a positive sense or messenger RNA virus and, like all viruses, is dependent on the protein-making machinery or ribosomes in the cytoplasm of the host cell. The process of reproducing the viral genetic code in the host cytoplasm is highly inaccurate and therefore prone to mistakes and substitutions resulting in viral mutations, most of which will result in viral death, but may also provide a Darwinian advantage with the ability of the virus to rapidly adapt to environmental pressures and ensure its survival. An effective virus doesn't kill its host, but harmoniously lives with it, allowing seasonal recurrences like the common cold and flu. However, with the introduction of a new virus, the first few years are the most dramatic as the virus kills off the most susceptible members of the community, while the less virulent variants survive and spread through the population. As such, assuming normal environmental pressures, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the human population will progress through this Darwinian dance where the most susceptible members of the human community and the most virulent mutations of the virus both succumb to the infection eventually producing a viral strain that is more infectious but less virulent than the original. So who is most susceptible? Epidemiologic data collected over the past two years shows an overwhelming preponderance to a severe clinical course or fulminant COVID-19 response to a SARS-CoV-2 infection in individuals who are overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, immunocompromised, and possibly darker skin toned, and we now have some theories why this may be. Remember that SARS-CoV-2 seeks out the ACE2 surface protein as a gateway for host cell entry. People often refer to this structure as a receptor for SARS-CoV-2, but I personally feel that that label is misleading. ACE2 is actually part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or RAAS, involving the kidneys, liver, lungs, blood vessels, and adrenals, the renin-angiotensin system is a closed-loop feedback mechanism that helps maintain renal blood flow. The kidneys are designed to filter the nitrogen waste products of protein metabolism from our bodies. To function normally, they need a steady flow of blood, receiving about 25% of the total cardiac output. A drop in blood pressure, either systemically from heart failure or locally from a narrowing of the renal artery supplying blood to the kidney, causes the kidney to secrete a chemical called renin into the bloodstream. Renin then links to a protein hormone produced in the liver called angiotensinogen, converting it to angiotensin 1. A second enzyme produced in the lungs, called angiotensin-converting enzyme, or ACE, then links to angiotensin 1, converting it to angiotensin 2, the active configuration of the hormone. Angiotensin 2 then acts on both the peripheral arteries throughout the body and the adrenal glands. The arteries constrict, and the adrenal glands produce another hormone called aldosterone, which causes the kidneys to resorb more salt and water from the urine. The combination of vascular constriction and salt water retention raises the systemic blood pressure and restores blood flow to the compromised kidney. Looking back at our ACE2 surface protein, the active form of ACE2 is produced by an additional enzyme called Shedase. Shedase cleaves the external component of the ACE2 protein and releases it into the bloodstream. The cleaved ACE2 then interacts with angiotensin 2, converting it into angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-7 is a powerful antioxidant and vasodilator. Dilating the peripheral vessels of the body and eliminating the action of angiotensin 2 on the adrenals, angiotensin 1-7 lowers blood pressure and is basically the counterbalance to the renin-angiotensin system. Hopefully from this explanation you can now appreciate that the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and ACE2 surface proteins are opposing biochemical processes that are in a fine balance determined by the patient's baseline health. Obesity, smoking, and a poor diet lead to heart failure and atherosclerotic narrowing of the blood vessels, both of which will invoke the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system to maintain renal blood flow. On the other hand, 
Regardless of age, an individual maintaining a healthy diet, regular exercise, and sleep will likely maintain adequate renal blood flow, causing Shedase to cleave the ACE2 surface protein, reducing systemic blood pressure, and creating a generalized anti-inflammatory effect. But how does all this affect the clinical course of a SARS-CoV-2 infection? Remember that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is looking for the ACE2 surface protein as a doorway to enter our cells. If the external component is shed, the virus can no longer recognize that region as a potential entry portal to begin viral replication. In addition, the soluble form of ACE2, now shed from the cell membrane surface, can not only counteract the effects of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, but can also bind to the spike proteins of the circulating viral particles, preventing them from even interacting with fixed ACE2 sites still on the cell membrane surface. In other words, your baseline health appears to be a significant or possibly the most important factor in determining your clinical course with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. There are four major structural proteins on the surface of the virus that can serve as potential identifiable antigens for our immune systems, including the spike or S protein, nucleocapsid or N protein, membrane or M protein, and envelope or E protein, all designed to house and protect the delicate genetic material in its hollow spherical core. Any vaccine using a killed or attenuated version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus would provide antibodies and immune memory to all four antigenic proteins and could be considered a quadrivalent therapy. On the other hand, the current generation of genetic vaccines only encode for the spike protein and are therefore monovalent. The idea that this monovalent therapy actually provides better immunity then exposure to the native virus is absolute nonsense and completely contrary to everything we know about viral infections and immunity. In fact, for a couple of reasons, mass vaccination with the current generation of vaccines may actually be problematic in our ongoing battle against COVID-19. Specifically, the choice of the spike protein as the monovalent target and the potential for vaccine-induced viral mutagenesis. In my opinion, the choice of a genetic vaccine that only encodes for the spike protein of the virus may be problematic. At first glance, this choice may seem appropriate since that is the structure that seeks out the ACE2 doorways to gain access to the host cells. Antibodies to the spike will bind to the viral surface, preventing it from interacting with our cell membranes, thus stopping the particle from gaining access to the protein-making machinery of our cells. However, remember that the ACE2 surface proteins are ubiquitous in the body found in the lungs, blood vessels, and kidneys, as well as the heart muscle and GI tract. When these spike proteins are released into the bloodstream, they can still seek out and bind to the ACE2 metalloprotein on our cells, but our bodies now have immunity to the spike and will try to attack it as a foreign invader. As such, all of our organs now coded in these genetically encoded spike proteins become targets for our own immune system. This may explain some of the observed side effects post-vaccination, such as GI distress, cardiomyopathy, and blood clots. There are also reports that these spike proteins can cross the blood-brain barrier and interact with the cells of our central nervous system, resulting in symptoms like sustained vertigo or paranoia. Now let's talk about the potential for vaccine-induced viral mutagenesis. As we stated earlier, messenger RNA viruses like SARS-CoV-2 are highly mutagenic due to their relatively inaccurate genetic replication. However, this can provide a Darwinian advantage as the virus can quickly adapt to environmental pressures to ensure its survival. The assumption that mass vaccination with a monovalent vaccine is going to rid us of SARS-CoV-2 is 100% false. In fact, I fear the opposite may be true. With native immunity, your body develops antibodies to all four antigenic proteins on the viral surface, requiring multiple survivable viral mutations to avoid detection. With a vaccine that only provides immunity to a single surface protein, only one survivable mutation to the viral spike is required to render the current generation of vaccines completely ineffective, leaving the most vulnerable members of our community at an increased risk of serious infection with subsequent viral outbreaks, and I predict this will happen before the end of 2022. In my opinion, the most important determinant of your clinical course with a SARS-CoV-2 infection is ultimately your viral load. Because of the haphazard way these mRNA viruses replicate, once you reach a critical mass of viral particles, you overwhelm the immune system inciting a cytokine storm and fulminant COVID-19 clinical course. One way to reach that critical mass is with a large initial viral load. 
If you're hanging out with a bunch of sick individuals coughing and sneezing all over you, no matter how healthy you are, you may quickly reach that critical mass of viral particles and get really sick really quick. As such, when I feel I've had a significant exposure, I try to decrease my viral load at the entry sites through the mouth and nose. I will gargle with mouthwash to attack the particles on the oropharynx and use my neti pod or nasal lavage a few times a day to reduce viral load in the nasal passage and nasopharynx. The other way to reach that critical mass of viral load is to provide more cell membrane entry portals for the virus, hence the increased risk of a serious COVID-19 clinical course in obese hypertensives. If you really want to protect yourself from infection, in my opinion, the best thing you can do, better than any repurposed medication or genetic vaccine, is get in shape. While I'm all for a body-positive attitude and feeling comfortable in your skin, at the end of the day, obesity is still a disease that eventually is going to kill you. With SARS-CoV-2, it just may be two or three decades earlier than we originally expected. For many years, scientists have suggested that vitamin D plays an important role in supporting immune health, especially when fighting viral infections. This seems to be especially true with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Many patients with a severe clinical course with a SARS-CoV-2 infection are noted to have low serum vitamin D levels. In fact, anecdotal reports suggest that vitamin D levels precipitously drop during an active infection, presumably due to consumption of the vitamin D molecule while the immune system battles the virus. While we can make our own vitamin D with limited sun exposure, our modern, predominantly indoor lifestyles usually preclude sufficient exposure to maintain adequate serum levels, especially in darker-skinned and older individuals who require longer UV exposure times to produce the same amount of vitamin D in less time than their younger, fair-skinned cohorts. As such, many doctors now advocate vitamin D supplementation to support immune health and oral dosing should be titrated to maintain serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels between 50 and 80 nanograms per deciliter. Minerals such as zinc and magnesium also seem to support the immune system either directly or synergistically with vitamin D and therefore may be important to defend against SARS-CoV-2 and other viral infections. The suggestion that subsequent outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2 infections are a disease of the unvaccinated is, in my opinion, completely unsubstantiated propaganda. As we know, the clinical response to a SARS-CoV-2 infection is extremely variable, ranging anywhere from nearly asymptomatic to death, and, for reasons iterated previously, we now know that this is a serious disease for a certain subset of the population who would also benefit most from the current generation of monovalent genetic vaccines. At the end of the day, as with any other therapy or intervention in medicine, it comes down to risk versus benefits. In a fit, healthy 20-year-old with adequate serum vitamin D levels and an estimated 60 years of life expectancy, the potential risks of a novel genetic vaccine are probably greater than any possible benefit and therefore should probably not be administered to this particular individual. However, in a 55-year-old obese diabetic with hypertension, the risk of dying from SARS-CoV-2 infection is substantial and therefore the benefits of monovalent vaccination far outweigh both the potential risk of the vaccine and the disease itself. Again, the only way through this pandemic is straight through it. Eventually, all of us need to be exposed to the native virus to allow our immune systems to acquire memory immunity to a complete set of SARS-CoV-2 antigenic proteins and fully protect us from subsequent outbreaks. The vaccine should be judiciously and responsibly administered to the at-risk members of the population to mitigate the impact of a SARS-CoV-2 infection and prevent as many as possible from dying in the process. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.